So you probably remember from last time uh, the process of going through and trying to find either a Thevenin equivalent or a Norton equivalent uh, circuit for perhaps a more complicated uh, network, okay? So I don't necessarily want to cover all that in super great detail again, but I do want to review it just um, kind of on a surface level. Um, the big idea there is that no matter how complicated a circuit network might be that you are trying to analyze, as long as it is linear, that circuit network can be reduced to one of two different kinds of circuits, one of which has a voltage source in series with a resistance, Okay, and that's called a Thevenin equivalent, and all you have to do is find the voltage value and the resistance value that are appropriate to model the complicated circuit that you're trying to do, and you've come up with something that will behave exactly the same way when it is connected up to another linear circuit. Okay, so that's the big idea there is that to find VTH, that Thevenin voltage, uh, what you have to do is just leave the circuit open. You leave the two terminals open, nothing connected to them, and you do whatever analysis that you need to do inside of your complicated circuit network to figure out what the voltage would be across those uh, open circuit terminals, um, and then that becomes your Thevenin voltage. Okay, so that's kind of the, the voltage side of it if you're doing a Thevenin equivalent. If you're doing a Norton equivalent, it's kind of similar, but in that case, you actually short across the terminals. You create a path for current to go with no resistance across the two terminals, and you evaluate how much current will flow through that short circuit, uh, again, based on an analysis of your complicated circuit network. Um, and uh, the resistance value winds up being the same whether you are doing this for the Thevenin equivalent as well as for the Norton equivalent. Um, and so, Anyway, that kind of covers how you come up with either what the Thevenin voltage is or what the Norton current is. And then when we talked uh, in previous lectures here, we've actually seen two different ways of coming up with what this resistance is that we have to put along with that source in order to make this uh, equivalent circuit behave properly, okay? Um, one of the ways is that you can actually turn off all of the independent sources in your more complex circuit network, and then uh, try to do some kind of an analysis across the two terminals with all those sources off, with all those independent sources off. You do an analysis across the two terminals to see what the equivalent voltage would be, or excuse me, equivalent resistance would be across those two terminals, okay? So that was kind of method one that I told you all about. And then I showed you that, well, if we add dependent sources into the circuit, it becomes much more difficult for us to figure out what we would even do to come up with that equivalent resistance across the two terminals. So what did we do? Well, the suggestion I gave you is, well, you could find just both the Thevenin voltage and the Norton current, and when you do, the ratio of the Thevenin voltage over the Norton current gives you that resistance value that you have to use. So you just find both of them, and then you don't have to find an equivalent resistance using things like um, resistor combination in series and parallel. Okay, so that kind of brings us up to speed on what we've done so far. Um, and I guess just to kind of, you know, really put some notes on it here, I would say you typically want to try to use option one if you look at the circuit network and you go, with all the sources killed, it's not hard for me to come up with an equivalent resistance using combinations of series and parallel resistors. If that's the case, usually option one is your easiest method. Okay? But then I showed you the one that had the dependent sources in it, and that made option one not work. So I gave you an alternative option, a little bit more difficult, because now you have to find both Thevenin voltage and Norton current, but it still works. Now let me give you another one where maybe, maybe neither one of these options may work. Okay? So look at this circuit that I have right down here. Okay? I've got a little circuit network right here, uh, kind of shaped like an H. Okay? where I've got these five different resistance values, and I want you to think, how would you go about, because there's no dependent sources, right? I should say that. There's no dependent sources in this circuit network. It's just resistors. So what would the Thevenin or Norton equivalent be for that network? Let's start with the easy side. Do you think there will be any sources? In other words, if you just look at that network and you say, what would the open circuit voltage be across A and B? 
okay? Everyone's probably saying zero. Some people said it out loud, but most of you are probably saying it in your head. Why do you know that? There's no source. Why would there be any voltage? There's no source making voltage, right? Or if you think of it the, uh, in terms of the current, if I was to put some kind of a, a link across A and B, a wire across A and B, what would there be that would cause uh, any kind of current to flow? There's no, there's no driving impulse or, or you know, driving uh, factor in this circuit that's going to try to make either voltage or current across those two sources. So it's actually pretty nice. We can say, well, VTH and INO, either one of those are going to be zero for that circuit. Okay, so what does our Norton or Thevenin and equivalent circuits, either one of them, what do they amount to? Just a resistor, right? Like that's, if, if you're saying there's no source, you can think of that as a zero voltage source or a zero current source, but either way, you can kind of just eliminate the source and you'll just have a resistance left and I'll kind of sketch that when we get to the end of this problem. So really finding the Thevenin or Norton equivalent for this circuit really amounts to finding what is the equivalent resistance across the two terminals. And that looks like it should be easy, right? We've been doing that for a while. So here's my first question. Do you see any series resistors? Those are usually the easiest ones to deal with, right? Because you just add together your resistance values. So do you see any series resistances in this circuit? Okay, you know that things are series when they have to have the same current flowing through them, when there's no other path for current to flow on. Do we have any legs of this circuit where we've got two or more resistors that have to have the same current? No, there's branches all over the place on this and there's no place where all the resistors have to have the same current in them. And so we don't have any, any uh, resistors that are in series. Okay, well now that here's the other question you might be able to guess what I'm going to ask. Are there any uh, resistors that are in parallel? We don't have that either, do we? Okay, why not? For a, for a resistor, for two resistors to be in parallel, they have to span across the same two nodes. Do we have any resistors that do that? We don't. And so this network that I'm showing you right here cannot be analyzed using the methods that you guys already know, okay? Just by taking series and, and parallel resistances and trying to, you know, reduce those down into equivalent resistance, that method fails for this resistor network. So what would you do if you needed to know the equivalent resistance of this network? I guess maybe there's a good question to ask. Does that even have any meaning? If I was to put a multimeter across the two terminals of this resistance network, would I read something? Would I read some kind of a resistance? Okay, I see some of you processing that question. Okay, the answer is yes, it would. You would actually read some kind of a resistance across the terminals of a multimeter if you stuck them on terminals uh, A and B. Okay, and let me tell you a little bit of how a multimeter does that evaluation of what the equivalent resistance would be of this little resistor network, okay? Here's what's inside of a multimeter, okay? So inside of a multimeter, um, when you are measuring ohms, okay? So let me just kind of point this maybe at another location where you're measuring ohms, and inside of your multimeter, what your multimeter does is it has like a little source of some kind, okay? and it tries to push that source out through the wires of the multimeter. And so then when you measure some kind of a network, okay, let's just kind of take any old network. It doesn't really matter what it is. Um, when you measure the, the resistance across this little network, one of those wires goes here, one of those wires goes here. Inside the meter, it's got a little, probably like a little voltage source in there. And it puts a little tiny voltage across the leads of your resistor network. And then what does it measure? The current, okay? So if it puts a known voltage across the, the uh, terminals of your resistor network and then measures the current, how is that useful for finding resistance? Ohm's law, right? The definition of resistance is V over I. 
right? So it puts a little bit of a voltage on there, measures the current, does a little calculation, and tells you what this uh, resistance value is. A good little point to make here is that um, this, your meter's technique of finding resistance, um, it, it pretty much presumes that you have just resistors hooked up to it, right? What if you hook something else up to the resistance setting of your meter, maybe something that has a source in it, okay? Your meter's method of doing this might break down to some level because if your meter says, I'm putting a one volt source here, but inside of the circuit network, there's another source that's kind of messing things up, it might not be able to do that calculation properly, right? So it's important when you're using a, a meter, typically you want to always make sure that you are um, not measuring something that has sources in it. You want to measure something where it's just resistive, okay? Furthermore, uh, different types of resistive circuits can be either linear or nonlinear. What if you have a nonlinear resistive circuit? Okay, your meter has to pick some value of voltage and then measure current. So let's say you have a voltage and current, uh, you know, you might have a voltage and current curve that looks something like this, where it's, you know, I'm just going to make something up here, but let's say it's curvy like this, and your meter puts a particular voltage on and then measures a current. Is it going to calculate the same voltage as if it had put a different excuse me, is it going to calculate the same resistance as if it had put this, a, a different voltage on there? So in other words, if you pick this point, you put this voltage on, and your meter measures that current, your meter says, well, that voltage divided by that current is the resistance. But what if your meter had picked a different voltage to put across your little network? Where would you be on this curve? What if you put a higher voltage on there? You might be up here on the curve, and my question is, that ratio of voltage to current at that location on the curve, is it going to be the same? No. OK. And so uh, the only way that it doesn't matter what voltage you put on and then the resulting current, the only way that that works to find a kind of uniform value of resistance is if the resistances inside of your circuit are actually linear. OK. Give me an example of a nonlinear resistance, if you can think of one. I'll give you one if you can't if you can't come up with one. All right. Here, I'll give you one. Have you ever tried putting a meter and put, setting it to ohms and putting it across a light bulb? If you do that, just a plain old light bulb, you will find that the meter measures extremely low resistance. You know, like probably in the in the fractions of ohms. Okay, but you are used to putting that bulb maybe across 12 volts or something to make it light up. Okay, so let's say you have 12 volts and you're putting it across a tenth of an ohm. How much current would that be? Okay, 12 divided by a tenth would be the same as 12 times 10, and that would be 120 amps. I, I promise you, 120 amps aren't going through that little light bulb. So what's going on? Well, it turns out the little filament of the light bulb changes its resistance value when it heats up. Okay, and that's actually a, a you know, that's a pretty well-known phenomenon that we can uh, identify is that as a, as a material tends to heat up, it usually becomes more resistive. All right, so that happens in the filament of a light bulb. And so a light bulb is essentially a resistive type of a load that you can put into a circuit, but it is not linear. Isn't that interesting? Okay, I've kind of gone off on a little bit of a rabbit trail here. Let's get back to this um, network right here. And now that you know kind of internally how a meter goes about trying to measure resistance, is there something we can do with techniques we have to almost put a virtual multimeter across this circuit? What would we do? We put a source on it, right? So we say, here's the original circuit. Let me copy it here real quick. Well, it's the original circuit, and we're going to pretend like we stuck a little uh, source across it, right? Let's take a voltage source, so it's kind of like what I, how I described how your meter might work, okay? Okay. 
what do you think? I mean, I can choose any value I want for this little source that I put across here, because all I'm going to do is take a ratio of the voltage over the current. So I can kind of pick whatever I want. What do you want to pick? I say there's one value you don't want to pick. Zero. Right? That one doesn't do much for you. But you can kind of pick any other value. What do you want to pick? One, right? That's a really nice, easy number to work with. One volt. Okay? You don't have to, but it's a lot of times easiest if you just pick something easy like that as a value. Then what? Okay? To me, I look at a, at a little circuit like this, and, you know, in my opinion, uh, mesh analysis is one of your easiest uh, ways to deal with a circuit that has kind of more than one loop going on in it like this. In a lot of cases, it's not always, but very often that's one of your easiest methods. And so that's what I'm going to do on this problem. So in order for me to do mesh analysis, what should I do? Okay. I need to identify my meshes. Let me identify one right here. I1. Here I'm going to do a little mesh that I identify and call that mesh current I2. I'll do another mesh right here and call that mesh current I3. Okay, good so far? All right, now how do I write these equations? We should be pretty comfortable with this by now, right? Let me start with mesh one and I'll start down there in the lower left corner. I'm going to start with a minus one volt plus what? 2 ohms times, okay, what I'll have there is I1 minus I2. Then I move on to my 3 ohm resistor, and what I'll have there is 3 ohms times I1 minus I3. And does that get me all the way around that mesh loop? It does. Okay, um, next, okay, that, that finishes that mesh loop. Um, next, I'm going to go to mesh loop two. I'm going to start down in the lower right, uh, excuse me, lower left-hand corner first again and start on that two ohm resistor. So there I'm going to have two ohms times what? I2 minus I1. Then I'll go around over to the 5 ohm resistor. And there I will have just I2 times that 5 ohms. Okay. Then I'm going to come around and go through the 4 ohm resistor. And there I'm going to have uh, I2 minus I3. Does that get me all the way around that loop? should. Then I'll go to the third one. The third one I'll have 3 ohms times, uh, there I have I3 minus I1. And then I'll go to the 4 ohm resistor, and there I will, I will have uh, plus 4 ohms times uh, I3 minus I2. And then I'll go around to the 6 ohm resistor and do uh, just I3. Okay. Now that little system of equations, we could take that and reduce it down to where we had the specific coefficients that we wanted for each one of our uh, elements to put into a calculator. We could then stick that into a calculator and solve it. In other words, to me, I feel like once you've written this equation, there's just a tiny bit more algebra to do, and then you plug it into your calculator, and you're pretty much home. Writing those equations is the hard part, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you how these things turn out, okay? So I1 ends up being uh, 0 0.29128. amps. I2 winds up being 0 0.08716 amps. Uh, 
and I3 winds up being 0 0.094. Oh, 04 amps. So here's my question. Um, what did I need out of all of that, you know, that whole task that I just did? Okay, we're using this technique similar to the multimeter, right, where it puts a voltage across two terminals and then does what? Measures a current. So here's the question. If that's, if think of that one volt source as being the multimeter supplying the voltage, what is the multimeter then going to measure? The current that the multimeter is pushing through that unknown circuit that's out there on the other side of the multimeter. So what would that current be? Okay, we could draw it on here as being this current. If it's pushing a voltage that direction, this is the direction we would assume current would flow if it's purely resistive, right? Or if it's kind of normal resistive type circuit. And so, um, you know, we can maybe call that, uh, you know, maybe something like IAB or something like that, right? So what would the resistance be? And I'm going to call that RTH because that's what it is, right? RTH is going to be the ratio of the voltage of one volt to what is that IAB? in terms of what we just found. I1, right? I1 is over where IAB is happening. IAB is not a part of any other meshes. So the entire value of I1 is the same thing as the value of IAB. See that? Okay, so I can just put that value down here, points uh, 29128, okay? That would be in amps. And so RTH, what does that end up being? I've got that it's 3.433 ohms. Okay. So if I want the Thevenin equivalent circuit for this thing, how do I draw it? Okay, remember the one volt source was something that we introduced. It's not really there, right? All we did was we put that in there so that we could figure out an RTH. So when we're figuring out what our uh, Thevenin equivalent circuit is, we need to make sure we take that back out. And we go back to what I started talking about a little bit when we first started talking about sources for the original network. It doesn't produce any voltage, right? If you just leave it alone, you look at the voltage across A and B, there's no source inside of there, so there's no voltage. So what you do for your Thevenin equivalent is you put a zero volt source in series with your Thevenin resistance of 3.433 ohms. That is the Thevenin equivalent circuit. But let me ask you this. What is a zero volt voltage source equivalent to? Okay, it's, it's the same thing as a wire. There's no voltage across it and it allows whatever kind of current wants to go through it. So this is actually the same thing as saying uh, something like this where we would have just a resistor. Okay, I drew it like the left one at first so that it looks like a Thevenin equivalent, right? But it's really no different than just having a resistor. Okay, what about Norton? Not much different, right? What you have there is you have a current source of a value of zero going across this resistance value of 3.433 ohms. Okay, 
What is that equivalent to? What do you do with a zero amp source? It's an open circuit, right? So that basically means you can kind of think of this again as just a resistor with a value of 3.433 ohms. And it's comforting that the Thevenin equivalent and the Norton equivalent agree with each other. OK? Cool, right? So the kind of one of the big takeaways there is when you have a purely resistive circuit, you are going to have zero values for V and for I, right? And so, you know, by itself, this may not be a problem finding the equivalent resistance if you have a nicely formatted re uh, resistor network that allows you to use like parallel and series relationships. You can just find your RTH directly. But I just gave you one where the topology of all of these resistors make it impossible for you to find your equivalent resistance that way. And in those cases, it's a, it's a good idea to be able to know how to use a test source to figure out what the equivalent resistance is, is on those circuits. OK, you like that? All right, well, let me show you. I've shown you a kind of things that are like this a little bit in previous lectures. I'm going to tell you what I'm showing you here. This is the final version. This is the whole deal. As a matter of fact, I took a little screenshot of these notes right here, and I put them up on Moodle for you all to see. Right, so that you could have access to these separately. Okay, so it repeats what I already talked about in terms of sources for Thevenin and Norton equivalents. Okay, but now on the, the option three that we have now added on the resistance side of this, uh, you know, on these notes on how to do Thevenin and Norton, I've added this extra thing that says with independent sources off, apply a test source so that you can establish. Uh, your Thevenin resistance. Okay, that third option is important anytime the network that you have become you know amounts to essentially a pure resistance. Right, it's important to have that one in your toolbox for those cases. Okay, um, now here's something I haven't really talked about yet. It doesn't matter which kind of a source you use in order to do this test source method. I showed you one where I used a voltage source of one volt and then measured current. Okay, what's the other option you think? It's up here. You could choose a current source and then measure voltage. Either way, the ratio between those two values is your equivalent resistance. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the next one I do here. I'm gonna probably flip it around and do one with a current source instead of a voltage source so you see what that looks like, but it's really not different. It's just, you know, which one do you find, which one do you assume, and then which one do you find, right? All right, so any, um, any questions so far about the method of using test sources or anything else that has to do with our Thevenin and Norton um, approach here that we've done so far? All right, if there's no questions, let's hop into kind of the, the last um, sort of category that we have here, and that is, what if we have a, a, a network where the only sources in that network are dependent? 